did Tyson really cheap shot you? Tyson didn't. His he hated his sparring partners. He, he he wanted to treat them like opponents. And so when he got in the ring with him, he just wanted he just wants to kill you, and um, like he does the the opponent coming at him. And so uh, he doesn't care. He hit you with an elbow. He hit you below the belt because that's the way he's fighting his opponent. There was always opportunities to spar with him because nobody wanted to because <laughs> it's not worth the money to get in there. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode number 172 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. And today we're going to step away from the player's side of things. You know, we've, we've kind of broken off. We've talked to some managers recently, a GM as well. But today we're going to go back behind home plate. For one of the legendary umpires in this sport, he has just recently retired. The one and only Ted Barrett. Welcome to the Chris Rose Rotation, Teddy. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. Don't know if I deserved that much uh, accolades in the introduction, but thank you for that. You stop that now. We're just getting started with showering you with accolades and gifts and everything else, okay? Okay. All right. So, uh, obviously, you made big news. You were one of 10 umpires that, that recently announced that you will not be returning after basically three decades uh, on the field. You know, you, you made it to the big leagues in 1994 and then several years later, full-time as an umpire. What was it like when you finally either signed your name or made that call and said, yeah, this is it, I'm I'm done? Yeah, it was uh, kind of surreal. It was strange. I talked to uh, Jimmy Joyce, Tim McClellan, uh, you know, some of the great umpires who retired before, and they all, they all said, hey, uh, you won't regret it. But it is kind of strange when you finally do make that decision. And for me, you know, it still hasn't even sunk in yet, I think, because it's January. I do what I always have done the last 30 years, getting ready to, to uh, go out for the season. So I think once spring training starts is when it's really going to sink in. Like when I start uh, looking for my uniform and go, wait, OK, I don't need to be out there. Well, I know you're going to be busy and we're going to talk a little bit about that. What's going to occupy your time from here on out. But uh, may I suggest um, maybe you could give scalp massages. For a living based on what happened with James Karinchek for my Cleveland Guardians during the most recent season. Was this the most bizarre thing that happened to you in three decades of umpiring? Yeah, I think that that one would be tough to top. You know, at umpire school, they didn't teach us how to do scalp massages, but <laughs> uh you know, James such a nice kid too. He kind of bent his head down and and uh so I didn't have to reach up there. And um yeah, that was pretty surreal. Oh, uh, you know, Austin Hedges is a regular on this show. And so we asked him about it. And the fact that neither one of you are cracking up while you, you're you're petting him kind of like a cat, Ted. I got to be honest here. Well, let me tell you, Chris, it was at the time I thought, boy, I really did a professional job there. But looking at the film after looking at the, uh, you know, the tape of it. And I was like, man, that was a little creepy. Uh, I looked like I was enjoying it a little bit too much. I don't know what's going on. I might need some counseling, but. Uh, that was strange. Did the other umpires give you a little crap where they're like, okay, Ted, really? <laughs> they, you know, they did say, uh, you know, you lingered, lingered a little bit too. You know, it wasn't so much the initial kind of checking, but then I was kind of patting his shoulders too. It was, yeah, it was, uh, hey, I'm a grandpa now. I, so it was kind of like I was trying to be nurturing. And, yes. I really, and, and to be honest with you, I felt bad for the kid because he's, you know, he's, he's out there and, uh, you know, who wants someone out there checking your hair when you're trying to get somebody out, right? Yeah. No, I'm good. We won't ask you to do that here on the Rose Rotation, but just in case you need another career change or whatever, we're here for you. Um, I appreciate that. You know, we did have one other umpire on the show, your 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 buddy Jimmy Wolf, and um, we talked about this. That There aren't a lot of kids that grow up and they're like, I am dying to be a major league umpire. You know, you were a real good athlete growing up. You played college football at Cal State Hayward. And so what in the world made you want to go to umpiring school? Yeah, you know, uh, Jim Evans used to say no dad ever uh, walked out of the uh, delivery room or the waiting room handing out cigars saying, I just had a boy and he's going to be a major league umpire someday. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And yeah, I, you know, we kind of fell into it. By the way, uh, yeah, Wolfie, I don't know if you saw him, but uh, it must have had over the holidays he ate a lot because I think he's he's ballooned up to like 4% body fat. and yeah. This I know. Disgusting. Hey, uh, he better be careful because double digits is right around the corner at our age. Yeah, that's right. He could be up to ten percent, but <laughs> no, he's uh, he's still in great shape. Um, but yeah, another guy was a great athlete, and if you look at our whole staff, 
a lot of us were great athletes. You know, um, the great Joe West, who just retired, he played college football, too. He's a quarterback and, you know, these guys golfing. And we, go, we used to get out and play basketball when we were younger. And But um, none of us, I don't think, wanted to be major league umpires. And for me, it was my dad said, hey, you got to get a job. I'm tired of paying for your gas and car insurance. And so uh, my friends were out flipping burgers or working at, you know, stores. And um, I started umpiring high school baseball and uh, doing three, four games a week, get, making decent money. Um, my dad was happy. I was outside in the sun working. Um, and I had a friend who said, you know, you ought to try doing this for a living. It was actually at Cal State Hayward after football practice. They were playing a fall baseball uh, for the college. And I called one of the umpires over and I said, Hey, how could I get into doing this? And he got me set up doing high school games and, um, you know, met some guys that were in the minor leagues and said, you got to give this a shot. So I went back to umpire school and which is really just a big tryout. I had no idea really, uh, if I make it and I got selected, went to rookie ball and it was always kind of, okay, I'll keep riding this out, see how long it goes until we get to here. And now, um, yeah, it's it's been a wild ride, but it's been really cool. But at what point did you realize, like, I've got a legitimate shot at cracking the big leagues? You know, I think it was when I got to AAA. Um, in my mind, for some reason, I always thought maybe I'd, I'd make it to AAA. And, then, you know, it, it, and back then there was so few guys and there was less jobs before replay. I think there was like 60 jobs before expansion. Um, so for someone to be egotistical enough to think that they would be the one to get selected, it's kind of crazy, but um, yeah, when I got to AAA and then you start um, hearing rumors about, hey, this supervisor saw you, he, he likes you, keep working hard, uh, you might get a shot. Then I started thinking, you know what, I might get a shot at this. And then I got called up and, uh, you know, I was in Tucson in 1994 working a AAA game and I uh, had a message to call, you know, uh, it's Phil Jansen from the American League and he said, we need you in Texas. There was a you know, it was the old days before uh, cell phones and beepers and things like that, uh, the message would be a red light. And we used to call each other. It's kind of cold, but we used to call each other and say, hey, this is Marty Springstead call. Or this is Ed Vargo. We need you in the big leagues. And then it was just <laughs> one of your buddies playing a joke. And so I thought it was actually a joke. So I pick up the phone and, and I call and, um, you know, Phil said, hey, we need you in Texas. Uh, can you get there tomorrow? And I said, uh, well, yeah, I can. So. Uh, I got on the plane. I remember flying there uh, and thinking, Man, I'm going to get there. And they're going to say, oh, we meant Barnett, not Barrett. Uh, sorry about that. Go back to AAA. But um, I went up and, yeah, it was all kind of surreal. And it was at that point I said, you know, uh, I could get a job and maybe do this for a living. And so was it was getting that call the equivalent of, in your opinion, of like getting a call to the big leagues for a player? Like, did you get numb? Did you call your family? Did you go nuts? Yeah, no, my, uh, I was living in Phoenix at the time, so my wife and we had two of our three kids um, were there, and they were just real, little, really small, and I told her, I said, wow, I'm going to the big league. So, yeah, I called my parents, she called her parents, and um, there really wasn't a whole lot of time uh, to just had to go. Like I said, before cell phones, so I couldn't text it out and um, just kind of got there and um, went out on the field. But I think it's very similar to a player. You know, I hear guys talk about, you know, when they got called up and then they had to go and, and pitch, right? They, they were starting pitcher. They were needed. Or, um, you know, a guy traveled all day and he got there and he had to go out and play shortstop and, and bat second. And, and uh, so it was similar to me was I just flew there, um, had to carry my gear with me and because there was no time to get it shipped and I'm um, showing up at the ballpark and, you know, here's a major league stadium. Uh, and, yeah, you're just walking in and there's not a whole lot of time to think about it or, get nervous or get scared. It's just go out and do it. Next thing I knew I was standing at third base. Uh, Roger Clemens is pitching. It's at Texas stadium and which was the first year of that stadium. So it was really cool. And now, you know, I'm getting, you know, we're getting old because now they build a new stadium, Right. <laughs> the new stadium when I came up and now it's brand new again. So it was very surreal. We had a rain delay. The lights went out. I mean, uh, it was like a, a biblical type flood coming down. I thought, Oh man, we're not going to be able to play for a week, but it's no kid. This is the big leagues. They actually, drain the field off and get it ready to go. And we went out and played again. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday and, and it seems like it was yesterday. What was the, uh, the first, like, I can't believe I'm in the big leagues moment. Was it working behind home plate and 
There's a famous pitcher out on the mound. Was it when somebody stepped into the batter's box and you just had to kind of take a deep breath and be like, wow, this is, I'm here. Well, yeah, well, that first night, yeah, like I said, I was kind of going on adrenaline and I worked third and then second and first. It was the White Sox and and, and the um, and the Rangers. And then I got on a plane and uh, we flew to New York. And so I had home plate. Um, and so my first plate job in Yankee Stadium and a Memorial Day. And here we go. You know, I'm standing there and Yankees is one of the stadiums that we went out and stood at home plate for the national anthem. So the national anthem's playing. I'm standing at attention with three big league umpires. Um, it was uh, the late Daryl Cousins. It was Jim Evans and the late Rick Reed. Um, and just standing there next to these guys. And again, thinking, okay, when are they going to tell me they made a mistake calling me up? <laughs> it's like first pitch comes in. Jim Abbott was the starting pitcher. Ah, awesome. And it was kind of, you know, uh, Don Mattingly digs in the box and it's like, whoa, okay. I used to watch him play. Uh, I was a fan of his before I went to umpire school, uh, you know, Boggs. And, um, you know, so you had these great players who were like, holy cow, I'm in the big leagues. And then the game's over, um, you know, in triple a, the spread's terrible. Um, you know, it's very, you know, ballpark food, hot dogs. And now we're in the big leagues and there's a steak waiting for me after the game. And they're like, Hey kid, don't eat that. We're going out for a steak tonight. And I'm like, no, I want to eat this steak. This looks pretty good. <laughs> but, but, you know, New York, there's so many great steakhouses. So we went and ate and, uh, you know, went and went to Runyon's was an old, uh, you know, watering hole and sitting there and listening to fans talk about baseball. And uh, that night I was like, wow, I, I'm in the big leagues. Um, could you hear us fans yell at you? You know, it's in the big crowds, in the big games, in the playoff games, you really can't hear anything. It's kind of a collective buzz. In the minor leagues, you could hear everything. I mean, I remember in Bakersfield, and there's certain people, like, it is their, like, I think, calling in life to go and just razz us and make our lives miserable. And, you know, it's the first inning. I'm like, okay, this guy's going to get tired and wear out in the fourth or fifth. No, he kept it going through the ninth into extra innings. And, you know, a place like Salinas, where there's only 20 people anyway, you can hear everything this guy says. So, yeah, making it to the big – or nickel beer night in Tucson. It was, you know, the guys out in the stadium just uh, going crazy. But, yeah, in the big leagues, in the the closer seats behind the plate, you know, they're usually people that can afford a more expensive ticket. They're a little more civilized. So the, uh, it's funny, too, the different parts of the country you're in. Um, you know, Philadelphia, New York, the guys are really going at you. Uh, in the Midwest, they're yelling, but they're being nice. Uh, but they think they're being mean. So it's like, uh, <laughs> like Kansas City, they're like, hey, Blue, you're not very good. It's like, <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, once in a while, you'd hear a, someone, someone, a voice will stand out in the crowd that will really be yelling. But for the most part, in the big leagues, it's you can't really hear that. Those individual voices. Who was the first guy that you ejected? Oh, my first ejection was um, um, and I, I could, uh, Turner Ward, who was oh. playing with the Brewers. We were in Detroit. Okay. And then about 10 seconds later, Phil Garner, the manager of the Brewers. So, uh, yeah, and I would – Turner would always – later as he was coaching and bring out the lineup cards, he'd always remind everybody that uh, I was his first <laughs> ejection. And, and um, yeah. And, yeah, so I got two for one that night. Um, I think David Wells was pitching. And we had a quick game going. And, uh, yeah, the Brewers thought my strike zone was a little bit too big. But, um, yeah, and Turner let me know after I called him out on strike three that he didn't agree with the pitch. So, but, you know, that was cool, too, because then the next day um, he kind of waved out in center field and I was at third base. And, you know, and, and just like I learned in the minor leagues, there's no grudges. There's no next day we'll start it over and get right back at it. And that's why I love the old school guys like uh, Lou Pinella who would, come out and throw a fit and kick dirt and throw a base. And then, um, you know, the next day he was your best friend again. Bobby Cox was the same way. Um, you'd see him walking up, maybe see him in the parking lot, walking to his car and say, Hey guys, have a great night. You going to dinner and have fun. Or you get to, uh, I remember Tim McClellan ejected him one night in Atlanta. And um, we went to, I think McKendrick's or Bones, one of those steakhouses in Atlanta. And Bobby uh, had a bottle of wine waiting for us and saying, um, you know, so we're not supposed to uh, 
accept gifts. But, um, you know, after an ejection like that, it was his way of just saying, hey, um, you know, nothing personal. It's his business. And uh, so that, that's why I love the old school managers like that. It was um, yelling and screaming. And the next day, like it never happened. Well, you did um, help him set a record. We're talking about Bobby Cox. You yeah. ejected him for the 132nd time, which was the most in baseball history, and that's a record that still stands. Did you know at the time that that was the record? Yeah, Chris, that's interesting because we were there in Atlanta about two months before that, and someone said, oh, he's tied the record. He needs one more for the record. You know, we were joking, well, maybe he'll get it tonight. We'll get it out of the way. But we came back to Atlanta the next time we saw them, I think it was like six to eight weeks later. And surely he would have been ejected in that time. I mean, he got ejected this week, but apparently he didn't. And, you know, I always feel like the fans really got gypped with my ejection because I rang up Chipper Jones with the bases loaded. He kind of tossed his bat and uh, went to the dugout. Now Bobby was yelling to defend him. I warned him to stop. I ejected him, but it was between innings. So, you know, the game, the networks were on break. And Bobby, after I ejected him, you know, Bobby came out and very calmly just kind of discussed this with me. He really wasn't a lot of yelling and screaming. And then he left. And I don't think anybody really knew he got ejected. And so, you know, the record, I think, should have been a, a grand show of a Bobby Cox meltdown. And it wasn't. It was very tame. And, the, and you know, the broadcast came back from break and said, well, Bobby had been ejected between innings. So I apologize to especially Braves fans who were expecting maybe a, a bigger show of it. And I wasn't able to provide that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept on behalf of all Atlanta fans, apology accepted. What's going on. You Rose rotation listeners, the NFL playoff picture is locked in and my go-to place for wild card round action is DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL and to kick off the road to super bowl 57. Holy cow. New customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in free bets instantly. They're just giving you money. Why not do it? Plus, all new and existing customers can get a no-sweat bet each day of the wildcard round this weekend. Just place an NFL bet of your choice, and if it loses, you'll get a free bet back up to $10. Action so good, why bet NFL playoffs anywhere else? The Jaguars snuck in. You got the Bills. The Bengals, the Eagles, a lot of great teams, a lot of great matchups this weekend. It's going to be awesome. Make sure to bet with DraftKings Sportsbook and download the app and use promo code ROSE and new customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team and get $200 in free bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code ROSE. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Now back to the show. Was there ever one where... A manager really blew up at you and you're like dude just calm down and go away yeah i mean once in a while you'd have a guy just kind of lose it and his veins popping out and it's i remember um the uh the a's manager ken maka oh yes and it was uh it, it was uh it was a big situation as i recall i could be messing up i think it was a divisional playoff game in boston at fenway and um, I think Miguel Tejada had rounded third and been obstructed, and then he just stopped. And after a sequence of events, he's actually – he was – Veritek uh, got the ball, tagged him out, and, uh, of course, it's a – you know, it's it's a misunderstood rule where we're going to place runners. And, you know, he felt that the run should have scored. But as he's yelling and screaming and the crew's together, he looked at me and he said, Teddy, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> And his face was getting red and his veins are sticking out. And I was like, Ken, just take a breath, settle down. He's, I mean, he was a, he's a very good guy, very fair to us, but I, I feared for his health at that point. I mean, um, yeah, it's a big game, but uh, it's not, not worth uh, having a heart attack out there on the field. Was there a favorite moment for you out on the field? Oh, wow. Yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, there's a lot that happened that I would just, try to stop and say, Hey, soak this in, soak this in. Uh, because, you know, when you're on the field and it's happening, you really, uh, don't have time to, uh, you know, kind of enjoy it. And so as my, as I knew I was getting toward the end of my career, I was trying to enjoy it and soak it in. Um, 
but I reflect back on some of the things that, uh, you know, the, the perfect games, I was lucky enough to be on the field for three perfect games and uh, some no hitters. And uh, just this last time, uh, Pujols, we were Albert Pujols in at the Dodgers and uh, he had a 700 home run. And I was like, wow, this is history. I'm standing at first base going, soak this in, soak this in. And so I was just looking around at the crowd and the fans and the people, um, Working World Series games, Game 7s. Uh, my first World Series in 2007, the the uh, Red Sox swept the Rockies. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, man, there's guys talking about World Series are hard. This was pretty easy. <laughs> uh, then 2011, <laughs> seven games. 2014, we went seven games. And those were, but in that 2011 World Series, I was working second base. My good friend Alfonso Marquez working the plate, and Pujols hit three home runs. I'm like, wow, this is this is something special, you know. This is uh, during the game, you got to concentrate so hard and be so locked in that sometimes you miss out on um, what's actually happening and its place in baseball history. Um, so, yeah, 2014, going seven games um, was, uh, you know, and then at the end, it comes down to the last at bat. I mean, that's that's what baseball is all about. That's when it's really fun. But for us, we're really um, bearing down and grinding. So now I'm kind of sitting back and reflecting on a lot of the, the big games that I worked in, really trying to, you know, reflect on that. And and I'm pretty amazed that, you know, uh, what Bonds went through hitting, you know, chasing the record and being a part of some of that. Sosa and McGuire, which was, you know, the, I was in the American League back then, but um, even having them as they, as we came together in 2000, uh, the things that they did on the field. It's pretty amazing when you think about it and reflect on it. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned that you were on the field for three perfect games. You were on the bases for Philip Umbers, but you were behind the plate. You're the only umpire to be behind the plate for multiple perfect games. You had David Cones uh, when he was with the Yankees. You had Matt Kane when he was with the Giants, obviously. Did, were you cognizant of history being in front of you? And if so, did you get nervous? Well, uh, the, the cone game, it was interesting because after the third inning, we had a rain delay. And I joked in the locker room, I was telling uh, Chuck Merriweather, I said, uh, we, we got to get back on the field. He's got a perfect game going. Well, you never see a pitcher come back after a rain delay. So I thought he would have been done. Um, and then we went back on the field and the game went on. Um, there, at one point there was something happened and Joe Girardi turned around to me and he said, something special is going on today. Of course, no one wants to say, you know, that he's got a perfect game because they don't, the superstition of it, but you think about it and, and Don Larson threw out the first pitch, Yogi Berra caught the first pitch, which he hadn't been at the ballpark in a long time. Him and Steinbrenner had something going apparently. And, um, so it's like, as this is going on, you're thinking, man, this can't, this can't really happen, can it? Um, and then as we got into the seventh or eighth inning, I remember looking up and I saw he was facing the minimum, obviously with a perfect game, but in my mind, I'm like, he's facing the minimum, but I couldn't remember if there was a walk and a double play or if, to, you know, so I'm going back through my mind and I couldn't remember. Um, and then of course I knew he had a no hitter as they're celebrating, but I asked Chuck, I said, was that a perfect game? He said, yeah, it was. Um, but now completely opposite during the Matt Cain game and about the fourth inning, I'm looking, I'm thinking he's got a perfect game going. Um, and he's got a good stuff tonight and he could, he could get this. Um, so now the second part of your question, you get nervous. Yeah. At, at that point, you just, you try to, you try to be as perfect as you can. I mean, there's pressure on in every game, but now it gets really under a microscope and escalated. And the last thing you want to do is be a part of the story, right? The great Jimmy Joyce, with uh, Galarraga's perfect game. We don't want that to happen. Um, but also, I don't want someone to go back and look at the replay of the game and say, oh, well, you know, the umpire gave him a pitch. He didn't deserve that. And you certainly don't want to be missing pitches where you then cost the guy a perfect game. Mm-hmm. So just trying to sit back, um, remain calm, do your job, call a ball a ball, call a strike a strike, and um, – you know, see what happens. There's been other games, that, and I, I can't remember any particular, but where guys have had great stuff and, you know, something happens, a, a, a clean base hit, a blooper, mm-hmm. um, an error, 
and uh, they lose it. So, you know, I call it catching lightning in a bottle. And it's pretty cool that I was able to catch lightning in a bottle twice behind the plate and a third time uh, at third base. So uh, I'm really uh, fortunate. And, and again, this is now I'm going to kind of look back and reflect on that stuff as I'm retired and I can think about it because I'm sure the player is the same way, but as an umpire, like I can't even think about yesterday's game because I got another one coming up here in a few hours. <laughs> and then that game's over and it's like, okay, and you're only as good as your last game. So uh, we just try to keep it going. Well, you guys, you strive for perfection. It's virtually impossible with the job that you have. Uh, we've had replay now for several years, which I think has been great for the game. But inevitably, I'm sure there's been calls in your career where you've taken them home and it's kept you up at night. How do yeah. you deal with that? I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think the, the, the fan realizes how bad we wear it. Um, and, you know, you feel so terrible when you miss a call uh, because now replay has helped that because at least it doesn't affect the game. Um, or doesn't, you know, stats are so important now to players. You don't want to cost a guy a base hit, or you don't want to, you know, cost a pitcher a, an out. Um, so replay can help some of that. But when you miss a play, especially before replay, and you go home and you're laying in bed at night, you just, you wear it, you feel like a failure, you, it bothers you. Um, and even though you tell yourself, don't let it bother you, you know, you're only human, it's, um, give yourself a break, but it, for, it's hard to get over. It helps talking to other umpires. I love talking to uh, older umpires. I remember working with Ed Montague and I had a play. I was in San Francisco. I'm sorry. San Francisco was in Colorado and I was working third base. I'd lost track of the count and Todd Helton tried to steal third base. Um, what Todd Helton was doing, stealing third base. I don't know. It wasn't the fastest <laughs> guy. A great player, but not a base stealer. And I thought it was, it was a three, two count. I thought there was runners at first and second, but there was Hughes at second uh, by himself, no runner at first. So I'm thinking ball four, there's no play. The catcher throws the ball down. There's the tag. And uh, so I watched the play, but I didn't really judge it, if that makes any sense. Uh -huh. And then I realized I've got to make a call here. I thought it was no play because it was ball four, runners at first and second, but it wasn't. And um, so I called him safe because that's what I thought happened in my mind. Anyway, I would have really liked replay to be there, but that was, that was probably the one time in my career where I had a mental lapse and I just, I felt terrible. I mean, I felt like uh, a complete failure. Um, I can live with a physical mistake, you know, like a player, but I can't live with a mental mistake. You know, this is my job to get this right and to pay attention. Um, but then Eddie shared a story with me where he was at second base at Dodger Stadium and uh, someone threw a paper airplane and he was following the paper airplane's trajectory and there was a pickoff at second base and he missed it. And he had an argument with Lasorda and, you know, it's, it's, it made me feel better. I'm like, okay, if Eddie did that and he's human, then I've got to give myself a break. Uh, but I, um, you know, I missed calls after that, but I never had another mental lapse like that. So um, and sometimes you miss a play. There's simply, uh, there's no way you could have seen it. Maybe you're the runner, um, blocked you out. They tagged him on the back, but you're looking, you can't look through his body. We don't have x-ray vision. So sometimes you can give yourself a break on missing a play, but then other times it's like looking at the replay saying, okay, what did I see that made me miss that? I should not have missed that. And every umpire, we then, we don't want, we hate that feeling. And so we do everything we can to try to figure out why we missed that call and try to get it right next time. And, you know, these are the conversations we have in the locker room after, like, what could I have done differently? Um, you know, maybe I should be in this position. And then a guy will say, well, you know, I like to take the play over here because then you can see his foot coming off the bag. And um, that's, uh, these are the conversations that we have. And, and I, I hope fans appreciate Mm -hmm. how much we try to get things right and how bad we feel when we don't. I know I do. We talk about it a lot on our other show that I do with Trevor Plouffe called baseball today. And sure. Do we complain about the umpire when things? Yes. I mean, we do, but we also understand. And he, he, he backs guys all the time. 
He really did. He even comes to Angels defense. Yeah. Well, Serious. You know, yeah, Trevor was great as a player. Um, I loved him. And, and uh, so he named his he named his kid Teddy, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And um, so I don't – I always told him, I said, you named your kid um, after me just so you can get a break on some of these calls. But um, – <laughs> Uh, it's uh trevor trevor was awesome and you know the, that's the thing with, with angel and i worked with angel for a lot of years and he really is a very good umpire and i and i know if i say that you know people think that i'm crazy but he and he's a wonderful human being that's what people say he is but you know I, you know when he first came up maybe um you know listen i'm not the same guy i was 30 years ago thank god um, and so I think Angel maybe had some run-ins with players early on who now are in, in the booth, right, are announcing. Mm-hmm. And they're remembering the run-in they had with him 30 years ago. And I always tell the, those guys when I run into them, I say, hey, he's he's changed. He's better just like we all are. So, uh, you know, Angel really is. He's a wonderful guy. Um, I have a lot of fun with him. I, I've done uh, some mission trips down to Cuba, and I took him with me one year, and it was – just so cool to see him down there that was his motherland right he was born there and, and he hadn't been back since he was five months old so wow you know if, i wish um i wish fans could know each and every guy individually on the staff because man they're such great guys they really are um you know cb buckner gets a lot of flack sometimes but and cb's a great guy he's uh, uh the good that he does back in jamaica you know, working with kids and, um, you know, he's a great player at Cortland. Um, I, he used to throw the ball back to the pitcher. I said, CB, you don't have a very good arm. He said, no, I was a center fielder. I was great. I said, I call bull on that, but I have a friend at Cortland who's part of the alumni association. He said, oh yeah, CB held, uh, held the record for stolen bases at Cortland. So I said, all right, I'll never question you again. Um, yeah, we've got our, our guys, again, they were great athletes and and they're really, really, Good people. I imagine you, you, it was funny. You said earlier that you guys used to play pickup basketball with all the. Now, I imagine the refereeing in that sport when we're talking about pickup hoops, there's guys calling fouls out of nowhere because we all know how just regular dudes play. But when a bunch yeah. of umpires are on the court, there's always one guy who's making call after call after call. And you're probably sitting there saying, Really? Is this what we're yeah. doing? Yeah, we're like, Hey, man, no blood, no foul. Come on. Let's. I like a physical game, you know? And these other guys are trying to call fouls and. I'd have fouled out in the first quarter, but yeah, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got guys that, you know, in the minor leagues, we need to supplement our income. And a lot of guys work basketball. And um, so they would, Hey, you're traveling on that. It's like, come on. We're in, we're, we're on a bet. We're on a school parking lot here at court. There's no net. We're not calling traveling. Come on. What'd you do in the off season to supplement your income? Um, yeah, well, I was, <laughs> You know, as, as a lot of people know, I was sparring. I was trying to, you know, make some money that way. But also uh, another major league umpire, Mike Everett and and uh, Travis Katzenmeyer, who was a, a minor league umpire, they helped me get a job at a juvenile detention center in uh, Mesa, Arizona. It's where the kids would actually, when they got arrested, bought off the street. And they were great because we could come and go and we'd come back and, and work. And then when we left for the season, um, you know, they'd say, all right, call us when you're back because that was hard in the minor leagues. You're trying to find something to make a buck. Uh, But also you don't want to burn a bridge. A lot of times guys would go and get jobs and then someone would hire them and train them. And then March would come and they'd say, Hey, I got to go to spring training. Uh, Well, you just burn that bridge because the guy doesn't want to hire you back. So guys substitute teach. Like I said, a lot of guys uh, would referee basketball. Uh, They'd referee wrestling, um, anything they could could do to make a buck. I didn't like refereeing basketball because uh, um, even though I loved playing it, I didn't understand the rules as well. And so I tried refereeing and people are yelling at me. And I, in baseball, when people yelled at me, I knew why they were yelling at me in basketball. <laughs> I, I yelled at what I'm doing here, but you know, I started uh, refereeing boxing and uh, you know, like a lot of players, they think they know the rules and they think they know how to umpire but if they really tried it, I don't think they'd be as good at it as they thought. Well, me, when I was boxing, I thought, yeah, referee, how hard could it be, right? You count to 10, you break it up. If a guy clinches, you know, you watch for a low blow. But I've been going through the training, and there's a heck of a lot more to it than than I thought. So um, I think that's how I'm going to scratch my officiating itch here going forward is reference some boxing. Yeah, you got well, 
there you go. I like that. Um, because your name is synonymous with Mike Tyson. So, you, but we have to clarify this because I did some digging and I, I couldn't find a definitive Ted Barrett versus Mike Tyson sparring this, that, the other thing. So please let's clarify this once and for all. Were you Mike Tyson's sparring partner? Well, I wouldn't say I was a sparring partner where I was on a regular rotation, but I did get to work with him in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas. And I wouldn't exactly call it sparring. I would call it more of a, a massacre. Because uh, <laughs> it was more like uh, me being the punching bag, um, but yeah, we we worked together a couple of days, and then um, but uh, he he needed someone that could could press him a lot more than I could. But I could take a punch. That's one thing I could do. Uh, but yeah, he was he was on another level from where I was, and I would see him in the amateurs quite a bit. But um, he was he was fought at two hundred one, and I was two hundred one plus, so. Luckily, um, I didn't ever have to fight him because I don't think but that would. You did say, though, that you ran into him in Vegas. So, I mean, he was a champion at 20. So, yeah. did you, were you fighting against him when he was the champ? No, no, it would have been before. So, he was, uh, he had just come out to Vegas. Let's see. Yeah, he had beaten, uh, was it uh, Trevor Burbick when he was 20, when he beat yeah. him? So, Trevor yeah, I remember Burbick. that. It would have been before that. So he probably would have been 19. So he was, uh, he lost to Henry Tillman for the 88 team. Yeah. So, but he got revenge on him in the pros. Um, and everybody. Like, yeah. did you know, did you know when you first fought him, you were like, this is the baddest MF or like possibly ever? Yeah. Well, even, even in the amateurs, everybody knew he is, uh, he's going to be a world champ. He's going to be a world beater. Um, even at 15 years old, he was knocking out grown men. Um, so, and with custom auto behind him, uh, he had all the right people behind him. There was no question, uh, that he was going to be one of the greats of all time. And, uh, you know, one thing he knew boxing history too. I mean, he was a fan of going back to the old films. Uh, he would watch, uh, all the old styles. He was a throwback too. Um, yeah, he was, uh, uh, I mean, you would see him now. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to mess with him. So I know, ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I saw his one man show. It was. I'll label it interesting. <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. My wife if and I, I went. I told him it was great because I wouldn't want to make him angry. Yes, that's true. That's true. well. <laughs> hopefully, he's not listening. To, he's actually probably tuning in because he found out you were going to be on the rotation, and now I'm going to be a dead man. Good job, Rose. Let's edit this out, Robbie. Thank you. Save my hide. Um, you know, one thing I always love talking to catchers about is the relationship with the umpires. And I mentioned that Austin Hedges is now a regular on this show. I think this is the first time I want to play a clip of the first time we had Hedgy on the show. I want to have you react to this. Here we go. Best interaction you have ever had behind the dish with an umpire. Some of my favorite interactions are with Ted Barrett. Whenever I get to, whenever I get to break down any time he took a punch from Mike Tyson, back when they used to spar together, it was right. just fascinating. He'll take like a foul ball off the arm, and I can see like the massive welt already forming, and I'm like, "You all right, man? Do you need like me to give you a second? I'm in." He's like, "He doesn't hurt. He's taking punches to." He said Tyson used to cheap shot him, hit him in the nuts. I'm like, "What? That's not okay." Mike Tyson is, that, no, that's not okay. But he would wear it. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a bad motherfucker right there. Ted Barrett. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He, uh, what a great guy he is, man. What a, what a gamer. He's a lot of fun to work behind. Um, yeah. And I, I take a shot and, you know, he'd say, Hey, you okay? I'm like, you know, I'm okay. You don't have to tell me, you don't have to ask me that. Uh, yeah. And he loved to, He loved to hear the boxing stories. Um, I told him George Foreman hit me so hard that my son was born two years later with a headache. That was, <laughs> that was a man that could hit. <laughs> That's good. That's good. But did Tyson really cheap shot you? Well, you know, it's funny because some of the guys I got to work with, they, they were so great. You, you'd get up in the morning, you'd run with them. If you were in camp, you'd play cards at night. Uh, they would be, you know, they talk to you. They'd even help you uh, with with some things you're working on. But 
Tyson didn't, his sparring, he hated his sparring partners. He, he, he wanted to treat them like opponents. And so when he got in the ring with him, he just wanted, he just wants to kill you. And um, like he does the, the opponent coming at him. And so uh, he doesn't care. He hit you with an elbow. He hit you below the belt because that's the way he's fighting his opponent. Um, it's, you know, they, there was always opportunities to spar with him because nobody wanted to, because <laughs> it's not <laughs> worth the money to get in there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I want to get back to um, the relationship between home plate umpire and catcher. Uh, how far do you let guys go? Like we talked about this. There's going to be days you struggle. Do guys turn around and say, Hey, Teddy, you're, I need that today. You're struggling a little bit. Is that how that works? Yeah. Well, they, you know, they don't turn around. They'll, they'll say something. And usually what they'll do, they'll wait until, uh, you know, say they have a pitch that they think you missed. And then the batter completes his at bat, whether he flies out or gets a base hit. Now, if he makes an out, they're usually not as mad about it, <laughs> but they might say before the next guy comes up, Hey, do you think that was, where'd you have that? Oh, I had it outside. Well, I thought it was on the plate. You know, they say it respectfully and it's a nice way of them arguing with you. Um, and again, if they made an out, they'd be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Now with the electronics, you know, they go back and take a look at things and come back and they're really not supposed to come back and they can be ejected for saying, I went and saw the replay. You missed it. You can't do that. But some guys you trust, a guy like a Hedges, I would say, uh, hey, did you look at the replay? It's like, yeah, it. you were right. It was just out. Or they'd say, yeah, I was on the corner. Or they'd say, I, I was batting. I didn't get a chance to look at it. Um, so there's a very – there's a respectful thing going on there. There's not uh, – and I got treated with a lot of respect. I always said – if uh, got to give respect to get respect. So mm -hmm. I would always respect the catchers, uh, but guys would get upset. You know, a catcher would get rung up on a pitch that he thought was a ball and then come back and, and he thinks you're calling, uh, uh, you know, a ball for his pitcher that you just called on him. And yeah, they'll get angry and they'll let you know, come on, let's go. That's a good pitch. Or, you know, come on, that's the same pitch you called on me. And usually that's, you let them maybe get that initial outburst out. And then, you know, they've got to drop it because if they want to keep it going into the next at bat, into the next half inning, uh, Hey, we're not talking about that anymore. And then they can be ejected from that point. So they know, they know how far they should go, especially the veteran catchers. And they also get to know our personalities. I think who will, who they can talk to a little more, um, who, who they can vent on a little more, uh, who they shouldn't say anything at all to. So um, yeah, I think that's all part of, good job of being a catcher also you get the pitchers out there that are you know setting up the tripod on you and staring in at you and you know <laughs> uh we use the catcher as a kind of a resource there like hey go talk to him and the good catchers as soon as it happens they hey i got him i remember randy johnson would you know he'd throw that slider inside he, he wanted you to call it because if you'd call that he was unhittable um but i remember uh, i was damian miller used to catch him a lot the first time Randy would give you that stare, Damian, would go, you didn't have to say a word. I got it. He'd run out to the mound. And that diffuses it. Now you don't have to – you feel like you don't have to fight with the pitcher because you got the catcher out there. And whatever – he might tell him, hey, this guy's terrible, but don't do that anymore. Whatever he's telling him, you know, it's working. And as long as he kind of gets you – gets that off your back, then then you're good with it. And that's what the good catchers do. And, you know, um, I know there's a lot of controversy with the game as far as, like, numbers and um you know the the metrics and all that i think what you can miss out on is a good catcher who maybe isn't uh that great of a hitter or getting on base but what he brings to the table defensively and handling the pitching staff and and handling us that's kind of immeasurable you know i think of a guy like a uh, steven vote um you know he would he would get on his pitchers when he needed to. He would tell them not to argue or he would, you know, but he's back there fighting for him. Uh, so, you know, these are things that, that, that you can't, you can't measure the intangibles of baseball. It's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. You know, I've actually become uh, through Millar uh, gotten to know Lackey a little bit. And I think Lackey was as bad as any pitcher. I saw him one time after one pitch, start pitching up a storm. I don't know who's behind the plate, but I remember watching the game with Millar. I was like, 
Kev, it's the first pitch. And he's he's like, yep, I tell him all the time. Doesn't listen. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are a ton of guys, I imagine, like that. Yeah, there are. But, you know, and, and John was – and he was a nice guy off the field. But, yeah, on the field, it's like, come on, man, really? It's the first pitch. You know, he's yelling both ways. It's like, <laughs> game just started. You're it's the first batter. Uh, and, and I actually, you know, I, I went down to watch the minor league guys work, and he was throwing a B game. You know, and, and B games, you know, are, are the game, the spring training games where there's no fans. Or they're just kind of sometimes it's an inner squad. He's throwing to his own guys. And he's yelling at the umpire there. It's like, come on, it's a minor league umpire trying to get some reps. <laughs> you don't have to yell at him. So, some guys um, just lose their mind. Uh, there is one other thing I want to touch on. Um, and we're going to get to what you're doing today or with the rest of your life from here on out. Um you worked the Sammy Sosa corked bat game when yeah. Tim McClellan brings out the bat and y'all are looking at it. We're like, Oh man, we really got to deal with this. Yeah, that was crazy. And you know, you think about it because Tim McClellan had the, the famous George Brett pine tar game. Mm-hmm. So I guess he, he got struck with lightning twice. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and I remember it was an inter squad game, right? It was Tampa Bay. Um, and I guess I think that was 2003, I'm going to say. Yep. Uh, with Tony Randazzo and Lance Barksdale. Um, and Tim brings the bat out. Yeah. And there's there's cork uh, in the bat. And it's like, we can't deny that. We've got a – and Dusty Baker was managing the, the uh, Cubs at the time. And he comes out. So this is one of those things as umpires that, you know, you learn at umpire school, but then it never happens. So we're talking, okay, so I think Sammy grounded out. The out's going to stand. We can't let the runners advance. And we're talking, and Dusty's listening. And then, oh, and and Sosa's ejected. And Baker goes, no, 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 he's not ejected. <laughs> we're like, Dusty, you're not part of this conversation. It's umpire. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you look, look over at Sammy, and he looked like a kid who had his um, hand in the cookie jar. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the funny story about that, though, if you remember the Albert Bell situation when they checked his bat at sure. um, at the uh, Comiskey or Sox Park, whatever it was at the time, and, and uh, they took his bat to the locker room and someone came in. Jason to- Grimsley went Jason- through the ceiling panels and replaced it with, I think, Paul Sorrento's bat. Right. Yes. Yep. And in the locker room, you could see where he came in uh, through the panel, down, jumped off the fridge. And so... Tim was the chief McClellan and he says to Lance Barksdale, who is now, um, you know, a guy that I worked with quite a bit. He was filling in at the time. He's a triple A umpire. And he gave him the bat and he said, go hide this where no one can find it. And Lance takes the bat and runs toward our locker room. And uh, he's not back. We played the next half inning without him. We worked three man. So <laughs> finally he comes out I'm like, where the heck did you go? It wasn't that far to the locker room. He said, oh, I hit that in his Mississippi accent. I hit that bat good. Ain't nobody going to find that bat. <laughs> he went back in the catacombs of Wrigley up above our laundry room into the unfinished area of the ceiling. <laughs> he hit that. I think he could barely find it after the game. So. Oh, that's great. He made sure no one was going to go get that bat and replace it. I love it. Um, what's going to keep you busy, Ted, from here on out? Oh, man, we got a ton of stuff going. Obviously, I'm hoping the uh, – the boxing referee thing works out. Uh, maybe get get in there and, and referee some fights. Um, Umps cares. Our Umps umpire charity does great stuff. I know you've been a great uh, promoter of that, and we appreciate that. Uh, go go to umpscare.com. Check it out. We help out kids in need. That was some of the funnest things I did during the season were the hospital visits. Um, that was very rewarding. Yeah, uh, being able to brighten up kids' day. We bring in build a bears and, and they would love it. Um, also I'm going to work with UPI, which is a baseball ministry. UPI is uh, seven former professional players and um, they go out into um, all over the world really. And they teach camps using baseball as a platform then to spread the gospel as well. Um, and so I'm going to come on and be their umpire. arm. I've done a couple trips with them. I've gone to Cuba with them, Germany. Uh, it's really cool watching the way they, of course, the Latin American countries, everybody loves baseball anyway. But in the European countries, it's really picking up steam. Good. The WC coming up this year and a lot of the former Soviet Eastern Bloc nations. 
uh, baseball needs instruction. But along with that is um, they need umpires, umpire training. So I'm going to be going along to some different places. I love traveling um, and get out there and teach them umpiring and then spread the gospel. That's two things I love to do. Uh, also hooked up with a, a ministry. I've got a heart for military guys. I know you do too. Um, but uh, Freedom's Rest is a uh, is really interesting ministry that um, it actually started in Baghdad during the, the war on terrorism. It was a, a place where soldiers could go, take off their armor, put their guns down and uh, rest, recharge, refit, which is a military term. Um, so this chaplain friend of mine used to take his soldiers there. So he wanted to start that here in the States. So in Tampa, he's got a, an area that he's going to call Freedom's Rest and he's going to take wounded warriors there mm. and um, first responders, police officers. Um, and uh, so I'm excited about getting involved in that. My wife and I got to fly to Tampa in a couple of weeks and check it out and, and see how we can get involved and, and, and help out. So lots of stuff going on. I, I won't be, uh, I won't be bored. Um, I'm hoping to MLB uh, has these umpire camps throughout the season too. They do uh, one a month and uh, hopefully I'm going to get involved doing teaching some umpiring there. Okay. So and then I'll be down at the boxing gym trying to help some kids out. And and uh, it's funny because, you know, the game's changed. And back when I boxed, things were so different. So I was there Saturday working with a, with a couple of kids. And I know they look at me and say, this guy's a dinosaur. And uh, so I'm going to have to learn a little, little more um, of the modern techniques than, uh, instead of going back to the old days. You know, and I've turned into that guy. I remember the old guy at the gym when I would be down there as a kid working out. And uh, looking in the corner, and there's this old guy, and you know he's talking about Jack Dempsey, and right. and uh, so you know I'm telling them stories of the guys I used to work with, and I know they're looking at me like this. All right, he's a nice guy; we'll listen to him. But so I think that's what the kids are doing now with me. But it's well, fun. You keep throwing out the name Mike Tyson; they're going to listen. <laughs> what is it? You, that one crosses generations. I don't care; you will stop in your tracks. You're right about that. They had, they all know who he is. And uh, like I said, he could come back now and, and fight. Or he did recently, right? Yeah, he still, sure did. Yeah, he's not someone I would want to mess with. No. Teddy, it was great really uh, getting to know you a little bit better. And um, yeah, I wish you luck, man. The game isn't going to be the same. We've lost 10 good umpires. Not lost, but you guys have moved on to the next stage of your life. And and it's hard to replace really, really good umpires. So I just want to thank you for everything you've done. Uh, you guys are truly like the offensive line here. We only notice you, unfortunately, when things don't go right, whether it's for fans or players or managers or whatever. But you guys do a hell of a job back there. And I certainly hope you enjoyed the uh, the three-decade ride. Uh, Chris, well, thank you so much. And, you know, the young guys coming in, they're really good. So you're going to have uh, uh, baseball is not going to lose a whole lot. But uh, I'm going to miss being in the locker room with the guys. I'm going to miss hanging out with them. But I love the offensive line analogy because that's what we are. We're the grunts. And we're out there every day getting at it. And uh, nobody notices uh, n notices us until we screw up or they think we screwed up. So, um <laughs> I'm extremely uh, thankful for everything that I experienced through the past 30 years, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, thank you for having me on and letting me uh, reminisce a little bit. And, and uh, man, tell Trevor I said hello and, and uh, tell him take care of Teddy. And That's great. That's, it's amazing that you remember it. He's got a Teddy. That's, that's, that's pretty good. By the way, are those baseballs behind you? I've been dying to know. Oh, yeah, man. So – this is cool. If anytime I work, uh, I always have my crew sign a baseball um, playoffs. Uh, I always got a ball signed by the crew. So there's a lot of umpire autographs. And then whenever someone would, you know, it's like at the ballpark, a guy singing the anthem or I'd run into people throughout the year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd always have them sign a ball. So, you know, I've got, uh, we ran into Dan Marino say, hey, we signed a baseball. And he's his first time I've signed a baseball. Uh, we ran the Snoop Dogg a couple times. He signed yes. a base. So I've got a really cool collection of of baseballs that aren't baseball players. And then uh, I've got some guys, too, that have retired, like uh, Griffey and, you know, um, some of the guys that I worked after. I would, a guy that was working, I would never ask him for an autograph. But once guys, unless it was for Umpscare, but once guys retired, I would ask them 
uh, you know, uh, Joe Torrey, who was uh, one of our bosses for a while, got an autograph ball by him. The great Frank Robinson, he actually uh, was one of our bosses for a time too. And um, so, yeah, I I love that collection because I look at it and it's part of the memories of it. And uh, yeah, that's, thanks for asking about that. Absolutely. Well, you deserve it. Uh, let's stay in touch. I, I wish you luck and a happy new year to you and your entire family and thanks for joining us here on the rose rotation this was a ton of fun oh thank you chris i really appreciate it we'll see you soon hopefully absolutely for our outstanding one-of-a-kind producer robbie Shirocco and the legendary ted Barry. i am chris rose we'll see you next time here on the chris rose rotation a production of john boy media if you like what you're hearing and seeing here on the chris rose rotation or on baseball today or anything else that we have on the jm baseball youtube channel we want you to like it we want you to subscribe to it so give me the old thumbs up hit the subscribe button once again you're not paying for a subscription it just means that you're going to get alerts and everything when all these programs come to fruition all right so give us a like hit the subscribe button and off you go and by the way thanks very much for your support